So I'm really delighted to be back again uh, doing an Oregon Wild webcast. Um, as it was mentioned, um, uh, right now I'm working for a couple of different organizations. I'm working for Willamette Riverkeeper, and I'm also working for a group called Bird Conservation Oregon, which uh, Dan Rolf, Mike Houck, Caitlin Lovell, and I started to deal with some of the most um, difficult and most complex bird issues in the state of Oregon. Uh, things like the Elliott State Research Forest. We felt there needed to be a group that could really dig down on the science, law, and policy on some of these really, really complex, intricate, difficult bird issues. And uh, there's a lot of good bird organizations in the state, uh, but we thought there was a place for one like this. So doing this presentation for their behalf and for Oregon Wilds tonight. Um, I also want to note that I worked for Oregon Wild uh, a little bit last year. I was on contract uh, and I've worked with them forever, and it is a fabulous organization, uh, both as a partner and as a uh, contract employer as well. They do amazing work, and they played a really important role on the Elliott. Uh, tonight, Casey is going to uh, give me a 10-minute heads up. When he does that, he's not being rude. It's because the last time they let me talk on Peregrines, I went for like six hours, and tonight we're hoping to cut it down by at least half. So with that, let's get into the Elliott State Forest. Uh, which is just an incredible place, an incredibly controversial place, a beautiful place, uh, kind of almost a mythical place, um, and a place that's incredibly important to a huge number of people, even though in some cases many people haven't really been there. Uh, but it's iconic, and it's controversial, and it's been in the news a lot over the last several years and recently as well. So with that, you know, I want to frame up a couple of questions at the beginning which is, uh, and I'll explain these as we go, can we move forward with an Elliott State Research Forest, which is something we've been working on now for several years? And the uh, related question is, should we move forward with an Elliott State Research Forest? Uh, both of those questions are in play because we've had a couple of uh, interesting events in the last couple of months that some of you may have heard about. Uh, the punchline to these questions is, is my response is going to be yes. I, I think we should and we can and we will. Uh, but I'm also interested in hearing your questions and your feedback tonight. But first, let's take a step backwards. Why do we care so much about the Elliott State Research Forest? Uh, this is a big state. Uh, it's got some amazing places. Uh, the Elliott State Research Forest is about 82,000 acres of uh, Division of State lands lands, and then another 10,000 around it that are owned by uh, uh, the Department of Forestry, um, ODF. Uh, why is this 82,000 acres in the Coast Range so important and so controversial? Well, from a lot of people's perspective, it's the crown jewel of the Coast Range. It's a place uh, that is um, incredibly important uh, to a lot of different people. First of all, it's the ancestral homeland to several different tribal nations. Uh, it's important to the local communities uh, as a recreational area, uh, for the economy, for timber. Um, it is important to environmental groups uh, because it has a lot of marble merlets, spotted owls, and coastal coast coho. Uh, in fact, uh, it's really a stronghold. We have hammered our coast range uh, in terms of logging. We've hammered the Elliott too. But in terms of these species, when you look at distribution maps for these species, these threatened and endangered species, uh, the Elliott State Forest uh, lights up like a Christmas tree. It's got some of the most productive salmon streams in the coast range, a uh, huge number of merlets, and a significant number of spotted owls, although there, there are very few left at all at this point. It's also been a hotbed of conflict for decades. And for those of you that haven't been there, uh, this map shows you where it's at. It's uh, down uh, in, near Coos Bay in Reedsport. Um, and uh, if you've been there, you know it's kind of magical. It's an incredibly uh, dense coastal forest, coastal rainforest, uh, oftentimes shrouded in fog. Uh, it's a tough place to get to. It's actually, in some ways, very accessible. Uh, you just follow the Umpqua River and turn right and head in. Uh, but there are very few hiking trails, really none. Uh, it hasn't been developed for recreation. There's a lot of roads, mostly logging roads. 
Oftentimes when you enter the Elliott State Forest, you enter into this fog shrouded landscape, it's this hidden landscape, especially if you go in the morning and suddenly these incredibly steep ridges start to loom out of the clouds and the fog. Uh, oftentimes uh, the valleys are still shrouded in it and uh, it just kind of, it's, it's almost magical in that sense. Uh, it's incredibly steep. Uh, if you look at this map in the center of uh, the screen right now, um, all of those dark uh, areas are slopes over 65%. So it's very, very steep. Most of the roads, by the way, are not down uh, by the streams. They're up on the ridge tops, which is a little different than a lot of our uh, road systems in uh, natural areas. Uh, wild rivers and streams, a lot of big trees, um, a lot of uh, clear cuts and plantations as well. And it's been very controversial for a long time uh, because it's been hammered for logging. Uh, it was part of the school Common School Fund. And for those of you that don't know what the Common School Fund is, when Congress admitted Oregon into the Union in 1859, certain lands were given to the state to be managed to support schools. And the Elliott State Forest was one of those uh, lands, land holdings. And so basically harvesting timber was a way to fund schools. Uh, that may have made sense in 1859, but it didn't make sense uh, by around 2016. I would argue really by 1859, it probably didn't make a lot of sense, but certainly by uh, uh, recent decades, it did not. But this put incredible pressure uh, on the forest to produce revenue for schools. Basically, uh, it pitted kids and education against trees. And the state made a decision, uh, a legally dubious decision, as it turned out, uh, that they had to get maximum revenue off of this forest every single year. Um, common school fund lands are managed by the Division of State Lands, not the Oregon Department of Forestry. And the Division of State Lands is directed by the land board, which includes the governor, the treasurer, and the secretary of state. And so for years and years, the state interpreted this mandate uh, to raise money for schools as go in and harvest uh, as much as you possibly can. That's a false trade-off. We don't need to pit forests versus schools. We do not need to pit spotted owls versus kids. But for decades, we had clear cutting, illegal clear cutting in many cases of mature and older forests. Now the Elliott relative to the Tillamook and the Clats up to the north is a older forests. There's a lot of older stands, but most of the forests burned uh, around the 1850s. And um, uh, there were a couple of big burns, actually. And so there aren't many trees older than that. Uh, so you're not talking about two and 300 year old trees, but you're talking about some 160, 150, 170, uh, some pretty old stands and a lot over 100. Uh, the forest has basically been about 50% clear cut. So of those 82,000 acres, about 41,000 have been clear cut in the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, the rest is uh, a lot older. It's got a bifurcated stand age for that reason. So you have a lot of trees kind of uh, in that 120 to 160 year range, year range and a lot in that 100 and a lot of 60 years and under. under. Um, there was a lot of protests on the Elliott. It's kind of legendary for its protests. Uh, a lot of blockades and tree sitters. This is one picture. Um, there were years and years, really decades of effort to negotiate out a more sustainable management strategy through um, various task forces and various planning processes. At one point they had a habitat conservation plan that they abandoned. Uh, a lot of frustration and ultimately a lot of resistance on the ground. Again, really a hotbed of forest activism. And one thing I want to say, you know, we now are in a collaborative period, a period where we're working together to try and find solutions with people we fought with for a long time. Sometimes I hear that we're having these discussions despite those conflicts. I would argue that we're having them because of those conflicts. I think sometimes People say, well, you can either have uh, collaboration consensus or you can have conflict. But oftentimes what it takes to get to a point where people are willing to collaborate and able to collaborate and have an incentive to collaborate are the years and years of conflict that came before. And 
So I give a lot of credit to those groups that sat in the trees, that blockaded the roads, groups like Oregon Wild that fight the hard fights, uh, that take on the controversial issues, that um, just do an amazing job pushing back on the system. Uh, we don't have these kinds of processes that I'm going to get into in a few minutes uh, without that kind of softening of the system first. And so it's not despite, it's because of that willingness to fight for these places. So as I mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of clear cutting on this forest. And uh, if you look at this map on the left, you can see the uh, light green uh, stands are less than 65 years of age and the dark green stands are greater than 65 years of age. So really, really, really fragmented. If you look at the right side, you can see the Elliott State Forest does have this bifurcated age class system. Uh, you have a lot of trees under 60 years and a lot of trees over really 110 years, and then not a lot in the middle. And then you have very, very few over 170, virtually, you know, just a few stands. Uh, so it's an interesting management challenge as well to think about over time. Ultimately, all this conflict resulted in litigation. And in 2012, the state came out with a plan to increase logging from 25 million to 40 million board feet. At that point, uh, Cascadia Wildlands, which has been absolutely instrumental in working to protect the Elliott, this is kind of uh, their, their place to fight for. Uh, and all the work that I did on the Elliott, I kind of think of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm sitting in for them uh, because they have been just stalwarts of protecting this place. Uh, so uh, we work incredibly closely with them uh, and I give them a ton, a ton of credit. Center for Biological Diversity and my old organization brought a lawsuit against the state. And that lawsuit argued that the way that they were clear cutting the landscape uh, was causing illegal take of federally listed marble merlets. And probably most of you know what a marble merlet is, but it's a small seabird, not much bigger than a robin, spends its life at sea, except for it comes inland to nest in old trees. And what it does is it lays a single egg on a large branch. And uh, if you look on the lower right, what that fuzzy ball is actually a baby merlet uh, sitting in a bed of moss. That's what their nests are. What the state would do was it would clear cut right up to the edge of marble merlet occupied habitat, sometimes into it. And when you do that, what happens is predators like the raven on the right, and he, he certainly looks like he's bound for trouble, can penetrate into that interior forest and they will eat the eggs. <coughs> uh, jays and crows and other corvids as well. Also, when you create a hard edge, you get blow down. And so what would happen is the state would come in, they would know the habitat was occupied, but they would clear cut these occupied areas into kind of starfish shaped uh, patches. And they would get lots of penetration by predators. They would get uh, lots of blow down. Eventually the merlets would disappear and then they'd clear cut the rest. Uh, we argue that was illegal. Um, that they could not do that. Uh, we brought a big lawsuit. We sued across three state forests, uh, the Elliott, the Tillamook, and the Clatsop. We challenged, I believe, 27 timber sales at once. Uh, most of them were on the Elliott. <laughs> and in 2014, the state of Oregon settled that lawsuit. They terminated 28 timber sales, uh, and they agreed to use a protocol to protect the Merlets. That was a really big win. It was a really, really big lawsuit, one of the most uh, complicated lawsuits I've ever been part of, uh, one that I'm incredibly proud of. Um, and, you know, I love Merlets too. Merlets are this incredible bird. We didn't even know where they nested until the 1970s. They were one of the great mysteries of ornithology. No one knew where they nested. Uh, and finally, they discovered that they were coming inland. These pelagic birds that spend their whole life at sea we're coming inland and nesting in older forests. Um, so along with the spotted owl, they're uh, much more well-known uh, listed fellow old growth species. Uh, you know, they are partially responsible for saving the old forests of the Pacific Northwest. And they're why we're having this conversation today as well. 
that should have been the end of the story, right? Uh, the state settled. They agreed. We had them dead to rights. Uh, they were going to protect Burlettes. Everything's great. Not so fast. Uh, they decided to sell the Elliot. They said, well, if we can't log it, we'll sell it to someone else and let them log it. It would have been illegal for someone else to log it, but it's a lot harder to keep them from doing it when it's in private hands. And so they immediately sold 100, 1,100 acres of habitat, did it very, very fast, uh, resulted in two more lawsuits. Uh, so we wound up bringing three lawsuits, uh, got some of that land back. Uh, they put the rest of the forest up for sale for $220.8 million. And in 2017, uh, uh, they put this out there for bid and said, basically, uh, come by the Elliott uh, and got a bunch of bids. Massive protests, really phenomenal, massive protests uh, opposing this sale. Uh, you can see some of the pictures on the right. Uh, Oregon Wild, again, was absolutely instrumental, uh, putting a ton of pressure, particularly on the state treasurer, Tobias Reed, uh, for his vote to sell. Um, I, I really give credit to Oregon Wild in large part for swinging his vote the other way. Uh, they were tremendously effective and their members have been tremendously effective at uh, putting that kind of pressure out there uh, when we need it. Really smart, strategic, targeted pressure. Um, and so eventually, uh, under Kate Brown's leadership, uh, they reversed course. They recognized that the Elliott should not be sold Interestingly, too, it wasn't just environmental groups, it was fishing groups, it was local communities, really nobody, uh, no matter which side of the logging issue you were on, like the idea of selling this public forest for private use. Uh, and so eventually they saw the light, they, they reversed course. In 2017, they terminated that effort and the legislature passed a bill authorizing $100 million in bonds toward decoupling the state forest from the common school fund. Now, because this is the big problem, right? Uh, there's this expectation that they're going to generate revenue for schools. Uh, they're cutting old trees to get that revenue. And so the solution, not so simple solution, was let's buy the Elliott from the Common School Fund. So it was appraised for $220.8 million. And the goal became to raise $228 million to buy the forest from the Common School Fund and get it out from that pressure valve. The school fund would get the money. They could invest it however they want. That's a much more effective way to raise money for kids, by the way. Logging older forests is not a great way to raise money. It's not particularly predictable. It's controversial. It doesn't get that much money. So the kids are better off with $220 million in cash. The forest is better off out from under this uh, pressure valve uh, that the uh, common school fund represented. Uh, at the same time that they appropriated $100 million, and so this is only a slightly less than half the money we need. They also voted to transfer the Elliott to the Oregon State University as a research forest. And they put together a task force that I'll discuss in a minute. And basically they said, we're going to buy the forest out. Oregon State University will take control of this forest. Uh, they will manage it as a research forest under the following terms keeping the forest publicly owned, and it is a public institution with public access, decoupling it from the common school fund and compensating. So we had to come up with another $120 million. Continuing habitat conservation and planning to protect species to allow for harvest, uh, and also providing multiple forest benefits, including recreation, education, and working forest research. So these are the terms under which it will go to OSU. Uh, a lot of skepticism in the environmental community. A lot of enviros do not like Oregon State University as a history of really hammering its research forest. It's never taken on something this big, nothing anywhere even close. This will be one of the largest research forests in the world. Um, state put together a task force, included uh, tribes. There were three tribal representatives on there, uh, included timber representatives, county representatives, um, environmental groups. I was on there. So was Mark Stern from the Nature Conservancy, Bob Van Dyke from the Wild Salmon Center, uh, locals, uh, hunters, recreationalists, so uh, and, and educators as well, Mary Paulson from the school board. We were asked to serve a one-year term of duty to figure out how to get this done. Again, this is 2017. It's 2024. We're still working on it. So uh, one year became uh, the better part of a decade, um, but we're making progress. Um, it was a group that I think everybody assumed would never come together, uh, you know, that this was a fool's errand. 
Uh, but what we found was a lot of people who were, for whatever reason, motivated to get this done. Uh, we developed a proposal, and I'm going to give you the basic parameters of what this would be managed and what it would look like. Some of these numbers are not completely accurate anymore. It's changing. There's a lot more current data. We've done some amazing LIDAR work. We know a little bit more about the forest when some of these numbers were produced. But the numbers you're seeing are more or less right. They're, they're not going to change dramatically. Uh, but don't look at the, uh, you know, you can round up and down a little bit. Um, but basically, it divides the forest into three kinds of management units. Um, about 66% of the forest will be in reserve. And if you look at that green area on the right, uh, light green and dark green, that is a uh, 32 to 33,000 acre reserve, one of the biggest reserves in the coast range. Uh, so a huge reserve, relatively speaking. The light green on the right-hand side are smaller reserves. And so there's a system of small reserves and large reserves on this forest uh, that comprise about 66% of the entire forest. About 17% uh, is... Uh, going to be in extensive forestry or ecological forestry, kind of a version of ecological forestry that was developed by OSU, um, where uh, there uh, will be small patch cuts, uh, various retention cuts, um, selective harvest from anywhere from 20 to 80 percent of the stand, um, and so on. Uh, stands will be managed on a 60-year rotation um, and then finally, uh, intensive, uh, which is clear cuts. Uh, they like to use euphemisms. I don't. Uh, intensive means clear cut. And there is still 17, about 17% 17 of the forest that will be in clear cuts. Those will be in 60 year rotations. For the most part, there's a few that are more flexible, but for the most part, 60 year rotations, so longer rotations, but they will be clear cuts. Um, and that was part of a research design that OSU developed to look at different uh, strategies on the landscape. Uh, over time, this forest will get significantly older. Um, and so uh, when you look at how this lays out over the next 80 years, uh, in about 50 years, about 73% of the forest will be older than 100 years. Um, and so it's almost a 50% increase in the amount of older forest relative to today. Uh, so it's not perfect. And uh, people can should and can be critical of the uh, proposal. Uh, I don't like clear cuts. I think we should be beyond them. But uh, we also believed, and the environmental community was very heavily involved in this effort. Uh, in fact, several conservation groups have met pretty much every week or every other week since it began. So going on, uh, what, uh, six years now uh, to talk about this plan. Uh, so people have been very, very engaged. We spent a lot of time reaching out, making sure people were connected and that there was buy-in. Uh, and there was also concern, too. Uh, certainly there's plenty of us that believe that it should have been, I think probably most conservationists believe the whole thing should be protected, but there's also a political reality as well. And, uh, the proposal on the table is pretty good. Uh, if you accept that the entire Elliot is not going to be protected, you have to meet multiple values on this landscape. We can talk more about that if people have questions. Um, but this forest is going to become... Uh, less fragmented and significantly older over time, and we have these big reserves. Um, riparian buffers are much, much better than what we have under the Forest Practices Act, uh, better than what we have under the Private Forest Accords, better than what we have on the Tillamook and Clatsop, not as good as what we have on federal lands, but we're going to have much, much better forest uh, riparian protections uh, than we've had historically as well. So there's a lot of strengths to this plan. Um, again, these numbers, take them with a little bit of a grain of salt, not a lot, but a little bit. 90% of the forests will be, 90% uh, uh, of the older forests greater than 65 years are protected either in large or small reserves, uh, 32,000 plus acre contiguous reserve area. Uh, in 50 plus years, uh, 70 plus percent of the forest will be mature or old growth relative to about 49% today. Uh, no trans stands of trees over 156 years of old will be harvested. Uh, that's anything that predates the 1868 fire. 
uh, 60-year rotations on most of the management watersheds, in some cases significantly longer. In a few cases, it can be shorter, but I don't think we're actually going to see that. Relatively strong stream protections. No spraying in the reserves, limited ground spraying in the ecological forestry areas, and um, only aerial spraying in the clear cuts uh, when there's no other practical alternative. No use of poisons for wildlife control activities, reduction in road density over time, increased recreational opportunities, research opportunities, integration of climate strategies, and potential for consensus and collaboration going forward. You know, I'm somebody that came out of the generation that was at the end of the really big forest wars in the 1990s. Uh, a lot of us have spent our whole careers fighting for the most part. Uh, but that was never the goal. The goal was ultimately to protect species, protect older forests. Uh, and, you know, uh, the question becomes, you know, what is the deal to cut? When do you cut it? Uh, based on a lot of discussion, intense discussion over many years, the consensus was this was the time to move forward and try to enter a new era. There's also some weaknesses. Uh, the research platform that OSU develop limits flexibility. Uh, in some cases, it's very, very frustrating. Uh, they put a very complex research overlay on this forest, but I think we are moving beyond that, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, there's about 3,200 acres of older forest that's greater than 65 years and less than 152 that can be harvested not through clear cuts but through extensive extensive treatments ecological forestry selective harvest uh, osu insisted that in that as much as 1400 acres of marble merlet occupied habitat could be cut because they want to research the impacts of forestry on merlets uh, there is nobody in the environmental community that thinks that is a good idea um, we don't need to do any more research on Mar occupied marble merlet habitats, uh, all the illegal hunt cutting that was done in their habitat prior to the lawsuit, uh, it was more than enough. Uh, OSU really fought for this. It was probably the most controversial thing. Uh, but again, I think we're probably moving beyond that now as well. Uh, those were hard things to stomach. Uh, there's no reason really to ever cut an older forest again either. But based on the benefits we were going to get over time, we felt that that made some sense nonetheless. Uh, not that we agreed to it with it, but that overall the benefits outweighed the costs. Um, and again, it includes clear cutting. And I put this picture in there because I don't want anybody to go away from this presentation thinking that there's no clear cutting on this forest. Um, I want people to go away with an honest view of what is being proposed. Uh, there And there is some potential for some aerial spraying. These are the high and the low points. There's a lot in between as well. In 2022, the Senate passed Senate Bill 1546, and that was basically to create the Elliott State Research Forest. That was to take all that work that had been done over the last five years and say, okay, we are making this formally into uh, the Elliott State Research Forest. And it's notable that every single stakeholder group that participated, the tribes, OSU, timber industry, conservation groups, uh, local counties supported this unanimously. Uh, they all went together to Salem and said, we want to move forward with this together. So it was unanimous. It was a very, very strong statement of coming together and agreeing that although we all had pieces we didn't like, overall, it met the needs of all the participants. Uh, and so in 2022, the state formally created the Elliott State Research Forest, it formally created a new authority, which is basically a new state agency to manage the Elliott. Now, it's not going to be a huge agency like ODFNW, but it was going to be a small agency with its own board. And they created a new oversight board as well. Interestingly, we all agreed there, too, that we weren't going to have two conservationists and two timber interests and two tribal reps, but rather that we should have seven to nine people who supported the vision of the Elliott State Research Forest, that we had to, you had to be on board to be on the board, um, and that it had to represent the various stakeholder interests, but we weren't going to just uh, divide the seats up. That turned out to be a really effective strategy forward, something for the conservation community to think about on these kinds of boards. 
uh, because we were able to put together a slate that actually everybody could agree upon. Uh, we weren't just fighting over one seat here or there. It was kind of how do we get a group of people that are representative and that are invested. Uh, it was one of the easiest boards I've ever been part of creating. And I think it's because we didn't tie it to uh, specific interest groups. Um, if you told me that five years ago, I would have said that's an insane approach, but it's worked. Um, importantly, though, DSL instructed, uh, or the the the, the uh, legislature instructed DSL to accomplish several tasks by December 31st, 2023, which just passed, in order for this to go into effect. And so this legislation only became effective if these tasks were completed within a year. And these tasks were to create a habitat conservation plan. And for those of you that aren't familiar with habitat conservation plans, that's an agreement with the federal government, uh, with NOAA Fisheries and U.S. Fish and Wildlife that says, if you do the following things, you are protected against take of endangered species, the thing that we sued them for. So basically, if you agree to a bunch of terms for protecting habitat and species, uh, you are basically immune from lawsuits. And uh, so that's been underway. Uh, they had to create a forest management plan, which is basically a 10 to 20 de year detailed plan of what's going to happen on the forest. Uh, they had to come up with a viable financial plan. How do we really fund this? They had to develop a management agreement with OSU. And if you recall, at the start of this presentation, I told you that OSU was supposed to own the forest. Along the way, it became clear that OSU really wasn't the right owner, that uh, they just weren't prepared to take on this big public forest as an owner. So there was a shift to let's create this new agency under the state to own it and have high level management and hire OSU to do the operational management. And so OSU was not going to be an owner, but they were going to be a manager. And to explore the potential for carbon credits uh, for basically uh, selling carbon credits on the forest to raise revenue and also protect habitat as well as part of this plan. So these things all had to happen. And if they didn't happen, this plan becomes a pumpkin. It disappeared on December 31st, 2023. The legislature also appropriated the remaining 121 million, uh, uh, there's a typo here, but the, uh, uh, the forest was appraised at 221. They appropriated 100 million several years back. We were supposed to raise the remaining 121 to completely decouple it from the school fund. In 2022, the state paid out the rest of that. So it became completely decoupled from the common school fund. So we are now out from under this pressure valve. They appointed the first board of directors for the Elliott that included Timber, uh, myself, uh, two tribal representatives, a couple of local representatives, a couple of researchers, uh, Teresa Bird, who represented conservation as well. Uh, it's a group that's for the most part worked really well together. Uh, and at the end of 2023, the Elliott stakeholder group was awarded the uh, land board's partnership award. Um, so uh, things seem to be uh, going pretty well at the end of 2022. But we always have to be aware of the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, and for those of you that are not for aware of the second law of thermodynamics, that is that the world uh, tends toward chaos. Uh, basically, if you wait long enough, things will fall apart. Uh, and we had been at this for a long time. And in recent months, things began to fall apart. And you may have read about some of this in the news or heard about it on OPB. As I mentioned, Senate Bill 1546 instructed us to get these tasks done. Um, and here's what happened. Habitat conservation plan took a lot longer than expected. It was a lot harder than anyone expected. Uh, there's an extension, but basically it's on track. We're going to get a habitat conservation plan. Forest management plan, also much more complex, uh, best laid plans of mice and men. Uh, everything was harder than any, everybody hoped, uh, but the forest management plan is on track. We'll get it done. A viable financial plan. That's where we started running into trouble. OSU came in with a very, very large budget to manage the forest. Uh, they wanted to hire a ton of people. Uh, 
from my perspective, and uh, they would have a very different perspective. Um, it was a gold-plated plan. Even when it was cut down in size, it was still a gold-plated plan. Uh, it was not financially viable from my perspective. And as a result of that plan, that started to put pressure on the forest to produce more timber. And we started to see numbers inching upward. And we started to see things moving around in those agreements that we'd come to that allowed us to move forward four and five years ago that we'd all signed off on over and over and over again. Uh, and so that became a real tension point. Uh, there was also uh, tension over the carbon credits. OSU decided that they were completely opposed to that, which was interesting because part of the way we might have funded some of their plan was through these carbon credits, but they didn't want that because they wanted to make sure they had complete flexibility to do whatever research they wanted. Uh, and so those became points of great contention and started to put pressure on the forest. And from my perspective, we had just spent $221 million of public funds to buy the Elliott State Forest out of the Common School Fund to take the pressure off the forest to fund schools. And we were starting to substitute pressure to fund OSU research. And whether it's research or kids, the result was going to be the same, which is despite spending $221 million, despite coming to these agreements, despite years and years of work, we were going to be under the gun every year to do more than is sustainable. And this started to create a great deal of tension. Uh, there were also other management issues that we couldn't come to agreement on. And uh, interestingly, it wasn't just the enviros versus OSU. Uh, I think some of the tension, uh, and again, OSU would have a different perspective. Uh, no doubt if they were presenting, they would say something different. Uh, but re the reality was uh, they, they, they increasingly were on a different path than everybody else. And so... On 11-13-2023, November 13th, 2023, remember, we had to have all this stuff finalized by December 31st, 2023. So we're talking a month and a half out, about an hour and a half before a board meeting, a pivotal board meeting in which we were going to really have to knuckle down and figure out how the hell to get these things resolved in a very, very short amount of time. And we were working around the clock. Uh, you know, it began to become a full-time job for a lot of us to try and get this done Everybody was really busting their butts to uh, figure out how to do it. We got a letter an hour and a half before a board meeting from OSU's president saying, it is a great disappointment that I share the unfortunate news that at this juncture, I am not prepared to make a recommendation to the Oregon State University's Board of Trustees that they authorize OSU to participate in the management of the Elliott State Research Forests. Um, you can read the rest of it. I put some of the letter on the right so you can see more detail. But... They knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, it happened an hour and a half before a board meeting. It was sent to the media. Uh, they controlled the narrative. Uh, I respect their right to decide that they don't want to be part of it. Every single one of us has that right uh, until we sign on the dotted line. Uh, but they made their decision. They've tried to walk it back since that time, saying they didn't withdraw. But the reality is the letter speaks for itself. Uh, they've said that they were misrepresented in the media. They got to the media before we even knew this was happening. So uh, they called their shot and they pulled out. Um, I'm not sure what they were thinking. Perhaps they were thinking that everybody would say, oh, my goodness, we'll give you everything you want. Please come back to the table. That didn't happen. The state, uh, which had been really pushing back on them, the state's been very, very good on this. The state basically said, you made these agreements several years ago you have to stick to them. We're not going to let you jack up the timber harvest in order to get more revenue off the forest. The state held the line uh, in a way that I didn't necessarily expect the state would. Um, and the state at this point said, we're canceling the board meeting. OSU, that's fine. We're going to regroup and we're going to see if we can go forward without you. I think that was a shock to OSU. So it's a good time to revisit those questions I put at the beginning. Can we move forward with an Elliott State Research Forest? And should we move forward with an Elliott State Forest Research Forest? There was a lot of panic. Um, there was a ton of panic. 
uh, right off the bat because, oh my goodness, you know, the research far research entity is pulling out of the research forest. It's over, right? No, it's not. And the reason for that is because recall OSU was originally going to own it and that didn't work out. So then they were going to manage it and the state was going to keep ownership. Uh, that management became smaller and smaller and smaller over time uh, as uh, various things didn't work out. So their role was not necessarily as big as what people felt it was. And so the board regrouped and met, OSU was there and worked through this. The land board also met and had a work session, no testimony and worked through this. And there's a new plan forward that is very consistent with the old plan. Uh, DSL, Division of State Lands, will retain ownership of the forest. It will remain in state ownership under DSL. The board that was created will be converted to some sort of commission, you know, like the ODF and W Commission or the uh, Board of Forestry or something like that over time. That'll take some time. Right now, it'll be more in, in flux, but it will still be in place. Um, we'll have to figure out what its official standing in, but the, the state is committed to that. Uh, so state will own it. The board will essentially manage it. The DSL will have a much, much smaller budget and they will hire staff to manage the forest day to day. They'll take care of uh, letting the timber sales, taking care of the roads, enforcement and so on. But it will be a much smaller staff. It's not going to be, you know, a couple of dozen people like OSU was proposing. It'll probably be a very small staff. We don't need a lot of people to do this. The HCP, Habitat Conservation Plan, will be submitted and will be finalized. The Forest Management Plan will be slimmed down because there's less stuff in it without OSU, but it will be finalized. The budget will be reduced to a sustainable level. One of the things we bought with $220 million was flexibility, you know, comfort. We don't need to always have maximum pressure on this forest. In fact, we're not going to have maximum pressure on this forest. It's going to be managed sustainably and thoughtfully. The research plan that OSU produced will be a guide. It won't have to be rigorously implemented any longer. It will be a guide to how the forest will manage. So you know where the reserves are, you know where the clear cuts are, you know where the uh, extensive forestry is going to be, but it's not rigid under the research paradigm where if, for example, uh, there's a particularly controversial site, you don't need to actually do it the way it's it's mapped out exactly. Uh, so some of that rigidity and some of the more controversial elements are uh, much more flexible now. And frankly, that's a really, really, really positive thing. And OSU is no longer going to be the manager of the forest, but the state has made it clear, and I agree with this, uh, we'd still like them to be part of it. Um, there could be, they could have a very big role in the research. They could certainly be the lead research institution, um, but they're going to be in a different role than what we anticipated. And they may be in no role. And we're going to invite other research institutions to be part of it. And there are things that we have to do in terms of research in order to monitoring, in order to meet the habitat conservation plan goals. Those are must do's. We will absolutely find folks to do those. The board will probably have a list of things that we think are priorities. And we'll look for people to do those. And if we have revenue, we may fund some of that. And finally, there's going to be, what do you want to do? What kind of research does, do various research institutions want to do? And uh, um, they can make proposals. Uh, so we're going to manage as a research forest. And I think we'll do some really, really, really exciting stuff. I'm actually excited because I think we opened up a window of opportunity uh, my perspective, uh, and again, OSU probably would have a different perspective, but the College of Forestry really, in my opinion, kept it, it confined to the College of Forestry. There, re, OSU has some of the best spotted owl, marble marlette researchers in the world. Uh, they have some of the best uh, Martin researchers, uh, the, the critter on the right-hand side of this picture in the world. Um, but those people weren't being engaged. Uh, there's lots of other research institutions as well. And I know there's a ton of folks that have approached me and said, how do I get involved? You know, the College of Forestry is kind of impenetrable. They kind of have this stranglehold on it. 
And so I'm super excited about the idea that, you know, we can open this thing up now and we can kind of steer some of that research. Uh, we should be doing Martin research. Nobody knows if there are Martins on the Elliott and they're not part of the habitat conservation plan either. Um, and so what we have now is a plan that will be very protective of spotted owls, marble merlets, and coastal coho. Pretty damn protective of older forests. And we're going to have a forest that is less fragmented, fewer roads, and significantly older over time. We're going to have one of the largest reserves in the coast range. We're going to have good riparian protections. Uh, and we still have the corpus of the collaborative effort intact. It was really exciting to see these disparate parties that have been at the table for so long raise their hand and say, I'm still all in. I'm good to go. I want to make this happen. Uh, and OSU will have to decide how and if they want to be part of it. Um, and so I think I have reached the end. The only other thing I want to mention, because I think it's really important, is uh, the CT Kludzi, uh, the tribes, uh, one of the tribes that was involved, um, uh, did have concerns toward the end as well. They were a group that, that did support the plan from start to finish, uh, but right at the end uh, said that they had some changes in leadership and their forester. Uh, and they started to have some concerns. And so they also, along with OSU, have raised concerns. Um, there has been a lot of effort to mitigate for those concerns. Um, one of the things that they are concerned about, interestingly, is uh, they're not terribly supportive of the reserves. Uh, they feel there should be more management in the protected areas. Uh, that's controversial. And um, uh, that's an agreement that's been in place now since really the first couple of months dating back five, six years. Um, I think the decision has been to really stay the course to all these agreements that we all made together, stuck with for years and years. Uh, but some of the changes in some of the numbers have been done to accommodate uh, the tribal concerns. And uh, there's effort ongoing there. I'll just speak for myself and say that, you know, this is the ancestral homeland of several tribes and it's important. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it's very, very difficult work to find a path forward that everyone, even though they have things they dislike, can still live with and get them what they need. Uh, and so we're working through that as well, but I didn't want to skip over that or gloss over that either. Um, last thing I'll say, you know, I always want to acknowledge the folks that have inspired me um, and the folks that uh, have been involved. There are so many groups that have participated in this Um I felt incredibly honored and supported uh, to work with so many groups and that have stuck with it and the groups that have been there every damn week for years. Um, groups like Oregon Wild that have come in strategically and kicked ass. Uh, but I wanted uh, Cascadia Wildlands, again, they live for the Elliot, so honor them. Uh, and then Francis Etherington, um, who many of you know, uh, Francis uh, has been fighting for the Elliot since long, long time before I was doing this work, and I'm damn old now, too. Uh, when I started at Audubon, Lynn Herring, who uh, led the forest battle wars for Portland Audubon, heard I was talking to Francis, and she said, you just, I was 24, she said, you just listen to Francis. Whatever Francis tells you to do, you do it. <laughs> so that was good advice. Uh, Frances is the patron saint of the Elliott State Forest. She comes to those meetings every week. Uh, she's always the one that keeps me honest and says, you know, have you thought about this? And I put that Martin picture in specifically for her because there has not been a week that has gone by or a meeting that has gone by that Frances has not said, what about the Martins? So uh, that one was for you, Frances. Uh, so with that, I will end and I'm happy to take questions. How did I do on time, Casey? Pretty good. I mean, it's six fifty-seven, so I think you rocked the hour mark. Um, yeah, I, I did want to know. I just a shameless self-promotion for Oregon Wild. I'm going to put some of our policy and program areas that are related to the Elliot in the chat with links. But thank you, Bob, so much for an amazing presentation. Um, you have really been a protector of this forest, and I really admire the hard work that you put into it. Uh, just like it's hard work working with people. Um, so I have a lot of questions in the chat. Um, and for those of you who are like saying, I, you know, I signed up for an hour. Um, it's okay if you want to stick around for questions. 
Uh, there's some really good ones in the chat and Bob's really good at answering questions. I know because I ask him a lot, but it will also be recorded. So if you need to ditch, go for it and you'll hear the, the answers later. And with that, I'm going to get us to questions. <clears throat> and I'm going to start with uh, Melody Clarkson, who asks, what kind of diversity of trees are there in this forest? And has there been an effort to add um, native coastal species that maybe aren't there? Yeah, you know, it's, it's a typical uh, Doug fir dominated coastal forest. Um, and so it's what you'd expect. Um, there, there are deciduous trees as well. Um, there's a lot of plantations. A lot of the, even some of the older stands are monoculture, Doug fir, very little understory. There's a lot of restoration work that needs to occur on this forest. Uh, and there's absolutely a desire to really think about this from a climate change perspective. And this is some of the exciting stuff with the research and also the tribal uh, management strategies as well. How do we really integrate those? How do we think about what species are going to be good for climate change? How do we think about forestry in a way that's much more diversified? Um, those are the kinds of things that absolutely, I think, are so exciting about this possible, this potential research forest is uh, you know, how do you take this landscape that's been really screwed with, really hammered for a long time and do something that's much more diverse? How do you think about the different species? And particularly, and I didn't spend much time on this tonight, but how do you really maximize the benefit for northern spotted owls, marble marblehead, and coast coho? Uh, so absolutely, uh, those things are front and center. They've also done amazing LIDAR. Some of the, They actually made a mistake and did like the super, super, super expensive LIDAR by mistake which means that we basically know every single tree on that forest. We can, it's, it's, it is, I've seen a lot of LIDAR. I've never seen anything like this. We have more detail on this forest than probably any forest patch in the state of Oregon. So we really know what's there now. What it, a great it, mistake, right? Yeah. Those it, are really it, exciting. We were like, I know that tree. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I can't wait. You know, one of the things that happened with the lawsuit is that there has been no, there's been no harvest on the forest for six years. Uh, you know, while we've been doing all this, it's it's just age, which is fantastic. And no one's excited about seeing harvest come back on the conservation side, but it's coming back one way or another. We're not going to have this status quo for much longer one way or another. So I'm excited about moving into the management stage, even though it means there's got to be some trees coming off this forest, because we're going to start to really have these conversations about how do you restore this, increase uh, connectivity, uh, increase plant diversity, create understory where there isn't, do the forestry that we do in a much better way. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that question. Okay. There's um there's a number of questions that are related to clear cutting and not a surprise. Um and I will get I'm gonna go through a couple of different versions so that you get a sense and maybe you can do a holistic answer. There's okay. a what's the supposed research value of clear cutting and how is that rationalized? Um there's a question about um with the new plan and new managers, instead of OSU, is there an ability to cut back on the amount of clear cutting? Maybe you won't need as much money. Um, there's one about uh, given the extent, historic extent of clear cutting, um, how is there a justification for clear cutting in Muralet habitat? Um, oh my gosh. Um, there's another one about uh, what are they going to replant clear cuts with? And I think you answered that as part of the diversifying the forest. Okay. How about that? <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm not surprised by the question um, and uh, you're not going to love my answer either. Uh, as far as OSU goes, uh, they, they basically felt that they needed replicates of clear cuts of various levels of selective harvest and then of reserves. So they compare and contrast how that affected the landscape. Uh, I don't think there's a conservationist on the planet that did not say you don't need clear cuts. You want a clear cut, go to the Millicoma tree farm next door. You've got like a 200,000 acre clear cut. You've got plenty of clear cuts on the Elliott. Uh, they were adamant about that. And uh, that was part of the deal that got the, the positives in into play as well. Uh, that was something that some of the local community liked, uh, the timber industry liked, the tribes uh were not so supportive of the clear cuts. They were less supportive of, uh, the Scootsie in particular were less supportive of uh, the reserves, but they also didn't like the clear cuts. What they really want is extensive forestry kind of everywhere. I don't want to speak for them too much, but that's kind of what they've been saying recently. So um, so OSU demanded it. Uh, it was important to some of the stakeholders. I tend to approach these things from not what are they getting, but what are we getting? Are we getting what we need? 
And we're getting a much better deal than we got on the Tillamook or the Clatsop. And I'm very supportive of that as well. Appreciate all the work that Casey and Oregon Wild is doing on that. Uh, this is going to be the best, but this is going to be the peak in terms of state lands. Um, but that was what we had to give to get. Um, and that was controversial for sure. And it was hard for all of us to get our heads around, but we did agree to it. I don't think that number is coming down. I want to be really honest with folks. Uh, it's a relatively small part of the forest. As you saw, it's about 17%. A lot more of it's in reserve. A lot more of it's uh, uh, going to be intact or semi-intact. Um, and that's kind of what we agreed to. And that's kind of the basic parameter that I think people should expect going forward. If we're going to move forward, uh, there are other stakeholders that that's going to be important to. So I don't want to, I don't want to bullshit anybody on that. Um, yeah, I hope it's a lot better though. So, and I, and I think without OSU kind of in the driver's seat, I think it's going to be more flexible. I don't think we're going to see some of the most extreme that the one other thing I want to hit here before we jump Casey is, uh, so that experiment, that was the most controversial thing that was frankly appalling. <laughs> that was something that I think more than the clear cuts was kind of like really, even though it was going to be a very light harvest, they were going to have 80% retention. So it was only going to be a 20% harvest. Uh, and there was all kinds of restrictions on it. Um, it probably was not going to happen. There were so many restrictions on it. It was going to be so expensive. They had to do so much monitoring. They had to find more lead nests. They started to realize that it wasn't feasible. I, for the life of me, do not understand why they fought so hard for that because it's so controversial. Even their own biologists were telling them that really wasn't the priority. Research buffers don't research whether even light logging in occupied habitat hurts merlets. It hurts merlets. We know that. Um, again, that 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 was probably the most gratuitously bad thing in the plan. The clear cuts make more sense in some ways, um, but it was a very light touch. It was very restricted. There were a lot of caveats for them to move through that over time. Uh, it was most likely not going to happen. I think with OLC in the picture. I think it's even less likely to happen. I'm okay. not going to say it won't, but I think it's very unlikely. Yeah, this would be a a, a simpler one. Very uh, thank you. Um, a very focused one is um, was there um, in the the OSU's version of the management plan was de road decommissioning part of it in um, reserves, and is road con uh, decommissioning part of the plan, or will it be in reserves going forward? It will. Um, they have to reduce road density, uh, not just in reserves, but there's a lot of roads on the Elliott. So uh, part of the plan, uh, it's, in, it's in the uh, forest management plan, is to, to do a, an assessment, a survey, uh, figure out what the priority should be, and over time, uh, it will be reduced. Um, there's there It hasn't been quantified as to what that reduction will be, uh, but I actually feel pretty good about that. I mean, based on kind of the whole orientation of this, it will happen. Uh, so yes, also removal of culverts and uh, fish passage, uh, improvement of, of problematic roads. A lot of the roads in the LA, as I mentioned, are up on the ridges, though. They're not down by the creeks as much, uh, which is a good thing. You know, there's fewer roads that are sitting right on the edge of the creeks and putting sediment in. That's not to say there aren't way too many roads, though. Uh, and yeah. then there's also discussion that's going to happen with the recreational community about what roads need to stay for access and so on. So, you know, there's a discussion to be had but I don't hear really anyone saying we need tons of roads here. And especially in the reserve areas over time, it's going to make sense to take them out. So, okay. That sounds great. Thank you. Um, there's one from earlier and I want to just make sure we get to it, which is, um, will the ESA standing of species, will the endangered species act standing of species affect the forest management? Uh, for, for instance, if spotted owls become extinct, will that open up old growth reserve areas? <laughs> Well, the forest, the Habitat Conservation Plan is an 80-year plan. It's a really long HCP, which has got good aspects. <laughs> it's got bad. It makes me nervous. Uh, but we're locking in protections for the long term uh, for merlets and for spotted owls. Uh, I will say that I think because there's about, a, and I think there's 24 spotted owl circles. A lot of them are unoccupied. It's a good question. Uh, spotted owls may go extinct, unfortunately, but uh, I think the protections will stick is the answer. Uh, and I think they'll stick because they're obligated under the HCP, whether the owls are there or not. Um, and because a lot more of the habitat is really captured by coho and marble merlets, um, 
there's a lot of overlap. So yes, the answer is I feel confident that unless the HCP gets broken and that can happen, but uh, we're, we're locking in some pretty tight protections and we're locking them in in multiple ways. Uh, there's They're also kind of locked in through other mechanisms as well. So it's kind of interlocking mechanisms on this one. Okay, that's super helpful. Um, there's a question about uh, Cascadia Wild because you repeated like these folks are really involved in the Elliott and why can't they manage it um, rather than DSL? <laughs> I like that you laugh, but it, it's important to understand kind of how all this fits, right? Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, good question for Josh Laughlin. Um, uh, you know, th there's been a lot of different proposals out there. Uh, you know, could we give it to the feds? Could we give it to the Sayusla and have it become part of the national forest? Um, you know, again, the politics on this, if this were easy to solve, we would have solved it a long time ago without, you know, 30 years of battles on the ground and in the courts. Um, and so there's a lot of different stakeholders out there that have a vested interest in it. And, you know, that might be acceptable to Oregon Wild. It might be acceptable to Portland Audubon, to my groups, uh, might not be acceptable to the tribes, to the local communities, to the timber interests and so on. So, Part of this was um, meeting multiple needs. And I, I know that's kind of a dirty concept sometimes too, but it's also a reality. Um, also- well, I appreciated, yeah. um, you You kind of touched on this earlier. I appreciated how you're like, these like figuring out how things work together and this collaboration comes out of prompting by like advocacy and stress, right? So you didn't use those words, but it feels similar. Yeah, you know, and, and I think, Related to that, you know, at the end of the day, when I have to kind of fall asleep at night um, and live with this, and I'm sitting there, you know, thinking about what the hell have we done? Um, and you have those moments. I think about, you look out 20 or 30 years and you say, man, right now, and we've been on this downward trajectory, frankly, and uh, we're battling like mad to improve things on the Clatsop and the Tillamook. And uh, we actually have agreement here, more or less, uh, with our historic enemies that we're going to have a much older, much more contiguous, much better protected forest. And they're not fighting us. They're saying we're 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 good. We're supporting it. We're doubling down on it. Uh, now, would I like to get more? Yes. But I also think there is a time and a place to say this is enough here and let's fight the battle somewhere else now. Let, let's make the most of this. I also think time is on our side. I think over time, we're now on a, a good trajectory. And I think as things evolve and as these communities evolve, there is opportunity to get better. There's not really much opportunity to get worse under this plan. Okay, and, that's super helpful. I think, so I think and hopeful. Well, it's upside. Yeah. Uh, and there are people that said to us, you know, why, why don't we just fight for everything? Well, we can do that for another 20 years. Huge amount of battle. Do we think we're going to get there and how much more are we going to get or is it going to get worse? And I think right now, if you look at the politics, if we had to do this over, I'm not sure we would do better. I think we do worse right now with the current politics. OK, that's very helpful. Um, so I, a question that you touched on a little bit, but um, what are the specific concerns that came from tribes? Um, and is it known at this point how much the harvest might change to accommodate the request of the tribes or like what's the what's the process for? integrating tribes requests? Great question. Um, and, and there are different tribes and they have different interests. And also, you know, I think sometimes people think about tribes monolithically, both in terms of, you know, multiple tribes, but also in terms of individual tribes over time. I think one of the things that is really interesting and dynamic, these, these, are, these are tribal nations, they're sovereign nations, they're political entities as well. Um, and so uh, you have disagreements among tribes, you have some competition between tribes, and you have tribes that are in one place one year and a different place several years later. And we've seen that in this process. And so that's a shifting dynamic. Um, I think what the state is saying basically is we're going to stick with the basic agreements. OSU, you don't get to increase the board fee dramatically. Audubon, you don't get to roll back the clear cuts. Um, uh, tribes, you agreed to reserves and and the system as well. They they have excuse me they have they have they have more standing uh, and they should. Um, uh, and there is a great great desire to make this work for them. 
Uh, and so there has been some shifting. Uh, it's in directions that from a conservation perspective, I'm not super happy about. Um, it's limited though. And ultimately, I think they're going to have to decide along with OSU, does this work? Do you want to be part of it? How do you want to be part of it? Uh, my hope is that they will. And I think, again, don't want to be disrespectful here. I think there are some misperceptions as well. There's been a lot of work built in to make sure that tribal uh, traditional uh, management perspectives are being incorporated. There's, um, for example, even in the reserves, they can cut older cedar for canoes. Um, there's a lot of talk about how you can incorporate fire into this landscape. There's a lot of different things that are going on. Uh, and, you know, we'll keep working at that. And again, without the rigidity of OSU's management paradigm, it's still there, but it's less rigid without them kind of really managing it to the nth degree. I think there'll be a lot more ways to accommodate everybody, you know, to, to, to soften those edges. So I, and that's a wishy-washy answer. Uh, but what I can say is I don't think there's anybody in the room who doesn't think it's incredibly important uh, that the tribes that want to be involved are involved uh, yeah. and they'll be ongoing. And and we'll, you know, as, as thinking for myself, uh, you know, there's some things that I, I will insist I'll work hard to make sure we're not flexible on. I, I think they're really important foundational agreements, uh, but I'll also look for those places where I can be flexible. That sounds great. Thank you for that. Sure. Um, so I, I would just want to get a few more questions in because they really are, they feel like they're across the range of question types. And one of them is how happy are the schools with the financial settlement? Like what's the outcome for this common school fund? The, the common school fund was delighted. You know, they were cool about it. They, you know, it's funny because there's a bunch of folks people are like, they got screwed. Um, you know, and you can do an appraisal one year and it can come out one way and you do it three years later and it's completely different. Right. I mean, you know, appraisals are malleable. They're getting $221 million. Uh, based on the most recent appraisals, they actually did maybe better than they should have done. But wait three years and maybe they did worse. I mean, but it's a lot of damn money and now it's secure. They have that in cash. They can invest it however they want. And you're going to get a much, much better rate of return on that than you're going to get on harvesting timber out of the Elliott. Uh, and by the way, the Supre state Supreme Court ruled that the state was wrong. They do not have to manage it for maximum revenue for schools year in and year out. That is wrong. State Supreme Court was clear about that. And so things were going to get worse for them, not better. So they were absolutely happy to take their money. And also they were very happy too that this has got this educational component. And we want to work in not just kind of this high-level research, but there's a lot of talk about how do you get grade schools involved? How do you how do you take this Elliott State forest and really make it into a research forest? Uh, and integrate grade schools and kids and colleges and, you know, world-class researchers. So we're talking about all of those things. How do you get the social scientists involved as well? Look at the effects of recreation and so on. Look at the effect, the economic effects of different strategies. Use it in terms of climate credits. Uh, there's talk about not just what is the value of carbon in trees, but what is the value of carbon in the soil and different treatments there. So it's kind of like these when you start to get into it, it gets really, I mean, I'm geeky, so I get super excited, but there's so much opportunity right here. So there's that's all this. Awesome. Up. Yeah. Sorry. Well, thank I you. Around that. No, that's, that's helpful to know. Um, I could, there's three different questions, maybe four here um, about recreational access. So how, uh, what's the, what's that component? How is it going to be funded? Is there enough funding for it? There, there will be, uh, you know, again, we're going to have a smaller budget. Uh, we're going to, you know, there, there's discussion about with, with with OSU kind of in charge, it was going to be kind of the full meal deal as fast as possible. And now I think everybody's like, let's let's ease into this. You know, I mean, let's use this capacity and flexibility we have to do this sanely in a way that's not super controversial, that doesn't stress everybody out and, and pick out the hard stuff first. But, you know, everybody's real excited about increasing the recreational opportunity. That has its upsides and its downsides as well. It's got to be managed. It's got to be done well. Um, but you know, how do we get some trails in there? How do we get more people in there? How do we manage it better? There's some timber theft on that forest. How do we deal with those kinds of issues and the problems that come with people on a forest too? Uh, how do we really, uh, get the tribes involved and what do they want to do? Um, so all of those pieces, you know, and that there's going to be an educational plan that will be developed under the new board. 
Uh, that's also a priority in the um, the forest management plan, which again is kind of that more detailed 20 year plan. Uh, the road plan is in there, the education plan, the, there's plans for plans basically. Totally, uh, totally. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and you know, again, this is the fun stuff where once we get going on the ground, we can really kick those things into gear. I can't wait to get out of this like six year bureaucratic phase and get into the the meat of this thing and do do the cool shit. Sorry. Yeah. Well, okay. along um, along those lines, uh, there's I think a, a real crucial question in here about um, do the good results depend upon the particular people involved? And can new people upset it? And really, it's like, is this the solution durable in the face of changing board members? Yeah, you know, I mean, that's the million dollar question. Um, I've been involved in a couple of collaborative efforts like this, one out of Mal here that has now spanned 15 years and generations. I think that first generational shift is incredibly important. Um, I think the answer is yes, though. I think, you know, and then I can go on for this forever and I won't, but you know, I think part of it is making sure that you have good facilitation on an ongoing basis. I think sometimes we think that when we get into this phase, you don't need that anymore. You need it for probably another 10 or 20 years. Somebody who really is running the trap lines every week, making sure that all the different stakeholders are staying engaged, seeing who has a problem, making sure it gets on the radar screen, gets addressed, that things don't fester, that new people are really bought, brought on and nurtured over time. Um, but the answer I think is yes, but it's a risk too. Um, we have these durable documents. Uh, I think we now have a reasonable, sustainable plan. Uh, I think we're going to have a good structure. I really like the structure of the land board, the board, and a unit within DSL, not over at Forestry, but you know, it really fits together in a compact, tight unit. I like the fact that the criteria for the board is that you're bought into the vision and that we're going to have a distribution of different interests, but first and foremost, you're bought into the vision. And if you don't want to be bought into the vision, don't be on the board. Uh, so I think we put good pieces in place, but we'll see. It could fall apart. You know, that's the reality is 10 years from now, we could be going, this is a train wreck. And yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, totally. Um, uh, well, a couple more, um, uh, one that seems pertinent. I was going to ask in case there weren't questions, but there's 35 here. So way to go, everybody. And I was going to ask, hey, Bob, is this replicable? Like, can people do this other places, go from conflict to collaboration to like protect a place? Um, and uh, Paul asks, um, uh, is there a way to, you know, connect with you about California's Jackson demonstration state forest? Uh, because it sounds like you're a lot further along here with the Elliott than down in California. So yeah, what, I mean, that's okay. I think Sekmar first. Yeah, I'd love to connect with anybody who wants to talk to me. Uh, I'm easy to reach. Um, Bob at Bird Conservation Oregon or uh, Bob at WilamaRiverkeeper.org. So uh, you know, I mean, it's uh, I can type it in. Do, do with your last question. There, but it's both. It's Bob at dot com. Uh, <laughs> so pr pretty easy. Um, uh, happy to talk to anybody. And, that sounds great. Um, okay. As far as whether it's replicable, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I mean, I think every every one of these really effective, complex collaboratives is its own unique dynamic. What I would say here, um, I think you have to find the people. You need to do that pre work is is so important, and I think the ones that have worked are ones where we've had a good. And there's really lots and lots of terrible consultants out there and terrible facilitators. It's the cottage industry of people that don't know what they're doing. Um, I am not a big fan of facilitators and consultants, but there are some good ones out there. And if you get a good one, I think one of the things they do at the beginning of this is they really do a lot of interviews of where people are at. Are they incentivized? Are they motivated? Mm -hmm. And that comes back to that, what I was talking about earlier about are people softened up to the point where they've been fighting for so long that they're ready to come together and they see possibility in collaboration that is better than continuing fighting. Are they at that place where they have an incentive to be at the table and make it work? Or are they there to blow it up and they think they're going to get more out of a lawsuit? Because if that's what they think, then that's what they should go do. And that's fine. I'm good. I, I've read a lot of lawsuits. That's fine. Um, and so make sure people are in the right frame of mind and not just the people that you bring to the table. Don't pick out the five people that want to agree and there's 500 people around them that don't make sure that they are well connected to their communities, that they're credible, that they really are reaching out, that they're connectors. Uh, make sure that the community is at least soft enough on this, that they're ready to hear it. Um, and I love the process. I like doing this work. I loved uh, dealing with groups that were like, 
you're totally selling out. You suck. <laughs> you're evil. <laughs> How could you do this? I, I find I, that that keeps me honest. I need that. Um, and you know, I need people who are asking hard questions because I'm going to be lying at night thinking about them too. I want to make sure I like to surround myself with people who are skeptical. And so that's that, you know, we would have a lot of long conversations and sometimes we had the same conversation 600 times. Um, and we kept checking back and saying, you know, mm -hmm. where are you at? You know, should, should we kill this? And people would think really hard. And I was really impressed. I love the conservation community in Oregon. We have the best conservation community in the world. People work really well together in this community. These groups I've always been amazed. You got other places and groups are fighting all the time. And here people try hard. They they like each other. And so we've had really good conversations and we had a lot of gut checks over and over again. And we had this people that came and said, yeah, um, I think that's why, I think that's a big part of making it work too. Um, yeah. So I'll yeah. stop there. No, I appreciate that. Um, can you confirm for me it's bob at birdconservationoregon.org? Uh, my, my email is bob at birdconservationoregon.com. Oh, dot com. <laughs> or, 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 no, no, I'm sorry, dot org, dot org. I thought, yeah. I thought it was dot org. Yeah, yeah. That's for TN. Okay, I've got two, two questions from one person. The second question is from me is when will the recording be available? And it usually comes to your inbox, the link about two days after this recording. So whatever today is, probably by Friday. Um, all right. And I think that, oh, so the last question is really one that I actually had too, which is who, um, there is going to be all this all this logging, there's going to be logging all across the landscape. Where does the money go? And um, why uh, is there is there going to be a carbon project on the land as well? And I think yeah. that's our last one for today. Yeah, you know, the logging will probably start up within a year or two. Um, I know when I see that first logging truck come off the forest, I will spend my afternoon vomiting. <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it's going to be hard too. Uh, and there's going to be trucks coming off. There's going to be a significant amount of timber coming off of this forest. Uh, no one should kid themselves. Um, but that is part of the deal. And um, and at least for my part of it, I'm, I'm not here to uh, go back on the agreements that I made. Um you know, and people can protest and do whatever they want and, and everything else. You know, I mean, people will have a right to weigh in. We're going to have a full public process so people will see the annual operations plans and have be able to comment on them. But it is supposed to be managed within this framework that we created, too. And the ability to challenge will be within the framework. Uh, so uh, just a reality check there. Um, all the money that comes off the Elliott has to go back into the Elliott. It can't go to anything else. That's okay. built into the legislation. And so 100% of the money goes back in. And my hope is that we're going to have enough money for the basic operations and we're going to have a real kind of streamlined, efficient operational unit. And then I hope we have more money than that. And I think we will, without hammering the forest, that will allow us to say, OK, we want to do Martin research. We're actually going to create some funding for that. Uh, we want to create some trails. We're going to have funding for that. We're absolutely going to have to have funding for road maintenance, letting timber sales and enforcement and those kinds of things. So, um, but hundred percent has to go back into this forest. There's no other place it's going to. And well, that's super helpful, right? I mean, there's roads to decommission and passage to create and that's and mistakes to correct, right? Absolutely. And we're going to have to negotiate those out too, because you have a diverse board that's going to have different perspectives, but it's, it, 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 we're, I think we did a good job of getting pretty aligned on where the priorities are. And, I, and you know, uh, even some of our friends in the timber industry, I think are pretty excited about this model. Um, I think they're reconciled to some of the things that they historically might have fought against. Um, yeah. As far as the, uh, the uh, carbon credits go, yes, uh, the state is going to, I have 100% expectation that the land board in February, when they're going to kind of formally have a comment period, people should know that in February, there will be an ability to comment. They're going to set the path formally at that point. They couldn't do it at a work session, but they are going to do it at a formal board meeting. And so they're going to start to lock this stuff in and they're going to tell us to take the next phase in terms of seeing about carbon dollars. From my perspective, that has to be additive. It can't be bullshit. It can't be a situation where... Uh, we're double dipping and we're taking climate dollars, you know, if somebody's getting to pollute and we get the money for something we would have been protected anyway. So it really has to be real, credible. We'll be watching that closely, but I do think there's a place here for that. 
and I'm also really excited about this idea of starting to look at some things that are a little more novel. You know, what is the climate value of protecting soil, of protecting yeah. stream corridors and things like that? Uh, so I think there's some great opportunity there. But yes, I think the answer is yes, it's going forward. Way That's in super up, helpful. A comment. So way That's in. right. And it's the land board, correct, that you people would be laying, weighing in with. Yeah, the land yeah. board for now. And I think eventually what you're going to see, uh, the, the board is probably going to be kind of a a fuzzy thing for a while because we have to probably have legislation and that won't come to a 225 to formally be something like the ODF and W commission. But the state land board has already said they're basically going to treat us like a board. And so a lot of it's going to be with us. You'll start to have opportunities to come to our meetings and we're going to create a real public process. Some people have said there hasn't been enough of that in the work up to this. I agree, but I think we're all recognizing and the expectation was absolutely in this phase, we're going to start operating like you expect a public agency to operate. Yeah, that makes sense. So you can come well, that's super helpful. Throw things at me and, you know, tell me I'm crazy. Totally. Um, I will say that I watched the, is, I watched my first land board meeting the other day because of um, the Elliot. And um, I came away very hopeful with the kind of the strength of uh, responses from our Secretary of State and our Treasurer and our Governor. Um, it was really inspiring. And I want to say that with that, Cheryl Johnson notes, this presentation is so hopeful and positive. We now have useful facts to counter negative presentations. This was totally awesome. And I will say, thank you, Bob. Uh, really, this was totally awesome. And it's because of both your energy and your hard work. So Thank, well, again, you. thank you, Oregon Wild, for having me, and thank you for your huge role in this. And thank you, Casey, in particular, uh, for kicking butt on the North Coast forests, which uh, are the battle that is right in front of us. So people should weigh in and uh, participate in that because that's that's a huge land area. That... And there's links in the chat. <laughs> right all right. Well, thank you all very much. We made it to 730 and we still have 70 people here. So obviously we wanted to hear from you, Bob. With that, have a great evening, everybody. Take care. Thank you so much.